Uh, uh, can you hear my microphone? Uh, okay, yes, we are yes, hearing yes. now. Okay, now you can hear me and you see the screen, right? Uh, the, the presentation. Okay, we see. Let okay, me... okay. And uh, you do you class? see ra rapid minor screen? Uh, can you see right. it now? Okay, yeah. you can see. Yeah. Yes, okay. So I can start now. Just, okay. just a minute, please. I would like to introduce uh, you. <laughs> to our uh, okay. audience. Okay, uh, thank you. So I would like to greet our um, uh, participant of the scientific practical seminar uh, that um, we have a, a great practice to uh, introduce very interesting uh, scientific, uh, scientific practical seminars uh, at the Institute for Development Studies that is established in Sulhan Sabah Orbeliani University. Uh, and the uh, last uh, seminars uh, we are dedicated to the uh, new research methods uh, and uh, today's seminar is uh, some kind of continuation of the previous seminars uh, that uh, we are uh, on the way to uh, find out some uh, interesting and uh, useful new ways uh, for research me methods uh, and uh, so today uh, our speaker is uh, uh, Professor uh, Nenad Petrovic, uh, lecturer of the Nish University from uh, Serbia. I would like to mention that uh, uh, Nenad is the author of more than 70 scientific papers and uh, on his uh, account is the uh, citation more than uh, uh, I would say more than 60 Scopus citation. Uh, so we have a great opportunity to listen uh, very experienced um, practical researcher. Uh, so I would like to give floor to uh, Mr. Nenad Petrovic. And today's uh, topic is software platforms in research and development. And uh, Professor uh, Nenad will uh, discuss uh, also very practical uh, case. I think that uh, today's seminar will be very interesting and useful. So floor is yours and you can start uh, Mr. Nenad. Okay, uh, greetings everyone. Uh, thank you for a very nice introduction. So I will quickly also introduce myself from one more perspective. Uh, I'm Nenad Petrovic and I'm working at Faculty of Electronic Engineering, University of Nish in Serbia at the Department of Computer Science. I'm teaching several courses at both at bachelor degree, uh, both uh, lower uh, years and higher years, uh, like uh, logic design course, microcomputer systems, information systems, and uh, 
courses related to signal processing compilers and technologies for information systems. Uh, when it comes to my education, I did my master uh, degree uh, at uh, Polytechnic University of Milan in Italy, and uh, I'm finishing my PhD at uh, Faculty of Electronic Engineering in Nish, uh, where I also did my bachelor. Uh, when it comes to industry experience, I've been uh, working as a consultant in a tech rain company, which is now uh, known as Soft Lab in Italy, Milan, uh, in area of uh, telco uh, adoption of data mining techniques. And on the other side, I'm currently also involved as a consultant for machine learning topic uh, on a project in company Sirmia in Nish, in my uh, city where is the university as well. Uh, when it comes to my notable works in area of data mining and deep learning, um, actually here are four most significant paper. Uh, uh, three of them are from conferences and one of them is a journal paper. So uh, as I already mentioned, I've been working as a consultant for a uh, telco call center uh, customer relationship management uh, platform. And I've been uh, studying how uh, data mining techniques can be adopted in this case. So uh, there are two papers uh, that I've wrote on this topic, uh, data mining in telco industry. Uh, one um, which was uh, even on a student conference when I was uh, starting my PhD studies and uh, one that I published later. When it comes to other works uh, adopting uh, deep learning, machine learning and data mining, I've been also working on load forecast and anomaly detection with my colleague in area of power engineering and um, smart grids and finally uh, work uh, related to uh, COVID-19 related predictions which is my uh, interest uh, now currently my research interest also goes in this direction as you will also see in this presentation many uh, types of predictions like number of cases um, and uh, so on. So uh, now when I uh, quickly introduced myself, yes, you can see my scientific publications on ResearchGate and Google Scholar. And uh, later, if you're interested, you can contact me regarding my work as well. So now let's uh, start with the presentation. So uh, when it comes to data mining, uh, we're all here, we're all somehow perceived that it's a inter interdisciplinary subfield of computer science and statistics that somehow aims to discover and extract useful patterns from huge amounts of data. And uh, the goal is to later adapt this useful information and knowledge that is extracted from data and somehow contribute to the improvement of business processes in various information systems and computer systems as well. So, um, for example, let's take a look at this diagram. Here we have an illustration of uh, decision support based on data mining in um, a business information system. Uh, so, for example, we have a lot of customers uh, that uh, perform some actions within the software that uh, actually uh, cause some events to happen, like transactions, for example. Uh, this da data is stored into database. Later, after that, uh, we have a huge amount of data about customer interactions in a database and we apply data mining techniques and algorithms in order to extract some useful patterns and knowledge from this huge amount of data. Uh, once we get the results, we can interpret them uh, either manually or automatically uh, using some other uh, method and uh, leverage the obtained results in order to improve our business processes. So uh, goals could be various, like retaining the customers, uh, causing them not to leave uh, our services, or even increase profit or predict something and uh, act proactively in order to prevent some consequences to happen, like uh, predicting uh, the risk of COVID-19 uh, for some person uh, based on um, a health state or predicting the number of uh, COVID-19 cases for a given city. So uh, these are various, there, there are various uh, case studies and uh, possible adoptions of data mining that can somehow contribute uh, to the improvement of various business processes in almost any area uh, of industry. Uh, when it comes to common data mining techniques, I may, here I, I highlight four of them which are most commonly used in all areas. 
The first one is classification. You probably all heard about classification. Like intuitively, uh, what comes to our mind first is that uh, the goal of classification is actually uh, to label a given sample and say whether it belongs to one class or some other class. So actually to distinguish uh, the given set of, sta of samples and uh, put them into different categories. The output, as I already mentioned, is here categorical data. So regarding the type of output that is expected, whether we want to classify, is it one class or another? If we only have two classes, it's binary classification. Uh, when it comes to multi-class um, classification, we have many distinct classes like cat, fish, dog, and uh, the observed image, for example, can belong only to one of these categories. And finally, when it comes to multi-label uh, classification, we have, for example, one example image observation. And uh, here, the possible output is not only whether we see cat or mouse, for example, or actually it can contain many labels, like we see both cat and mouse and fish, for example. So uh, these are three types of classification. Uh, when it comes to notable use cases in uh, business information systems, and as we will see, uh, according to case studies that I propose in tourism industry as well, uh, is churn prediction. So, uh, churn prediction is actually the task to identify the customers that are likely to cancel subscription or leave some service provided by the operator or some uh, company. So, uh, you can see the illustration on the right side. Um, for example, the pool represents uh, the base of users belonging to one service provider and uh, fish is actually one user or a customer. So um, what is actually the goal of churn prediction? To identify whether one customer is going to maybe switch to another uh, service uh, provider. So it is of utmost importance to uh, save from uh, huge losses uh, companies in all areas. Uh, it's very commonly used in telco industry, and I had experience with this particular case, but it is as well applicable uh, in many ways in tourism industry as well. So when it comes to other technique, uh, which is also widely known, it's regression. And here uh, we have different goal. Here, uh, actually, uh, the, the main difference between classification and regression is the fact that the goal of regression is to actually output numerical uh, value. So it's numerical, not categorical output. We have somehow model the relationships between the input uh, scalar, uh, between the uh, some one or many inputs, independent variables or in input variables, in order to predict the scalar response, which is called output or the dependent variable. And it's numerical. Uh, what we can use for uh, regression in uh, business information systems and generally uh, what comes, what is actual now. So to predict the stock prices or cryptocurrencies prices, these days it's a very hot topic, like the fluctuations of uh, Bitcoin, for example, are quite interesting uh, for many parties. So applying regression to predict what would be the value uh, for Bitcoin the next day is uh, of huge importance for uh, in uh, financial from financial perspective. On the other side, in other areas like uh, smart grids and power engineering, uh, predicting the energy consumption uh, demand is also of utmost importance, as um, unpredicted uh, uh, larger request for energy, uh, the demand can cause outage and many damages directly on on. on or indirectly. And finally, we are all witnessing, unfortunately, the current situation related to COVID-19, uh, something that we can see every day on many websites that are regularly updated, like uh, COVID-19 uh, cases, uh, current number and predictions as well. So uh, the third technique that, uh, that I will also talk about is association room mining. It's popularly known as market basket analysis. What is the goal of this technique? Um, unlike the previous techniques here, we don't have like um, output that is categorical or numerical value, but it represents a set of rules that are discovered within the uh, list of transaction uh, 
entries. So, um, to be more general, it's, it is a process that looks for relationships uh, between the objects that go together within the same business context and discover how are they related. Uh, one notable example is physical products uh, market basket analysis. Like, if someone is going to buy a mobile phone, uh, is it likely that he will also buy or she uh, headphones and power bank? So this type of analysis, discovering the products that, do, that go together uh, within the same bill, for example, in a supermarket or some uh, on the other side digital store, which is very common for uh, gaming uh, industry, uh, like buying the set of items that go together well for the same character, uh, 3D avatar, uh, is also useful uh, as uh, both of them actually enable many uh, case many use cases like cross-selling, uh, giving products together as a bundle. Uh, moreover, uh, when it comes to physical products, the shelf arrangement is also very important uh, and customer habits uh, can be explored using market basket analysis uh, in order to identify what, what is the best arrangement, like putting chips and beer nearby is uh, maybe more common as customers would go for that. But it doesn't mean that it's like this, but it's just an example. Um, when it comes to customer retention as well in telco industry, uh, we all know uh, telco operators give uh, different plans that contain different number of minutes included, gigabytes, uh, data transfer, and uh, many other services. But at some point, combined like with, with churn prediction, if it is identified that customer is likely to leave, uh, a bundle uh, with uh, att attractive products can be offered to the user in order to retain uh, the customer within uh, the operator's service. Uh, like the bundle of products that uh, will motivate um, the customer like present or gift uh, that could somehow make him or her stay within uh, the service contract. And the final uh, technique that I will also talk about and give some practical exa examples is clustering. Uh, the task of clustering is to divide, uh, to split uh, the observations from some data set into a number of distinct groups uh, such as that samples that belong to one group, to the same group, are more similar to others within that group, while they're dissimilar or different uh, compared to uh, the examples that come from other groups. Uh, two notable case studies of clustering are, on one so side, market segmentation, like to split customers into different categories in order to uh, design products that would be suitable for them. It is also quite applicable in tourism industry, and you, you will see it in the examples as well. And fraud detection, for example, if someone is trying to misuse a service or a credit card or some other product that belongs to the operator, uh, clustering can also identify uh, some outliers that are uh, outside the normal boundary of service usage, or re regular uh, tasks that are done within the service. And final uh, theoretical observation that I will show, and uh, later we switch to more practical part of this seminar, are performance metrics. So, uh, when we do some predictions or uh, when we do some uh, task using data mining tools, how uh, can we actually be sure that we are doing something well? So, uh, re depending on the type of particular technique and algorithm, we also have uh, different uh, performance metrics and different evaluation methods. When it comes to classification, uh, what is common, commonly used approach is to adopt confusion matrix. It has four, uh, act, four possible, uh, to say, uh, uh, types of values that are considered. So, in this table, you will see uh, actually what how uh, confusion matrix looks like. So the dark blue is predicted class, but light blue is actual class. So P means po uh, positive and means negative. So if we kept that actual class is positive and predicted class is also positive, then it is considered as true positive uh, observation, uh, which is output of classification. On the other side, if we have that predicted class is uh, uh, belonging 
to that class or positive, but the actual value of class label, the real value, is uh, negative, it is false negative. On the other side, if uh, the expected observation value is uh, for the prediction negative, actually that some sample doesn't belong to the class that we are looking, uh, actually, and we achieve positive as outcome, it means that it is false positive and it, it's not a good result. But if we have that predicted, actually, uh, the, that pr predicted class is negative, but the actual class uh, that we have in our data set is negative as well, then we have true negative examples and it's uh, hit uh, like uh, we have the right prediction. So these two true positives and true negatives are uh, actually uh, correct classifications while false negative and false positive aren't correct. So uh, when we, once we calculate, calculate these values we, uh, regarding the output that we achieve, we can calculate uh, further more these three ma ma matrix. The first one is precision, and it is defined as ratio between true positives and sum of true positives and false positives. Uh, moreover, we have recall, which is a ratio between true positives and sum of true positives and false negatives. And finally, there is a balanced score, the so-called F-score. Uh, this is a uh, more uh, b balanced metric that uh, actually takes into account both the precision and recall. It is a, a, a division of like uh, the ratio between uh, the precision uh, multiplied by recall divided by precision summed by recall and multiplied two times. So, moreover, um, we have regression uh, matrix like uh, relative error, absolute error, and root mean squared error. When it comes to relative error, it is quite obvious that it is the difference between the observed and expected, the absolute value of the difference, divided by the expected uh, value and multiplied by uh, 100 in order to get uh, the value in percentage. Uh, when it comes to absolute error, my mistake here, I'm sorry, uh, it is uh, expected minus observed the absolute value without this 100%. So um, this is, this is uh, the absolute error, which is uh, one me metric as well and is not commonly used, uh, relative error is something that is more frequently used in this area. And finally, we have root mean squared error, uh, which is defined like the sum of uh, differences between the observed and expected, squared and divided by the number of sam uh, samples and a root of uh, that. So uh, once we finish with the theoretical part, now we'll switch to more interesting and practical part of this seminar, which uh, is uh, uh, which refers to Rapid Minor Studio and applications of Rapid Minor uh, algorithms uh, related to data mining in area of uh, tourism industry, especially uh, regarding the current COVID-19 pandemic situation and recovery of uh, tourism industry. Uh, using these uh, tools and approaches. When it comes to Rapid Miner Studio, it's a data science software platform which provides a very nice environment uh, graphically with nice graphical user interface and covers the functionalities of data preparation, analysis and visualization and uh, it exists since 2006. Uh, there, is, there is also a commercial version but uh, what I will show is a free edition it has some small limitations, like uh, 10,000 rows within the data set and one logical processor can be used, which, can, which is actually a bit slower performance compared to full-fledged uh, uh, commercial version, which enables a huge parallelism, but uh, uh, for basic tasks and uh, some uh, non-crucial um, mechanisms, it works as well. Like, uh, for some non-critical applications that are not where someone doesn't someone's life doesn't depend of the execution speed uh, and something like this, um, it's widely adopted uh, by uh, many uh, researchers from different areas uh, and in industry as well for prototyping. Um, uh, what what is uh, the fact that make the, this uh, Rapid Miner Studio so popular? As I said, it has very nice graphical user interface. 
which is suitable not only for people who are coming with engineering background and computer science, but people from other areas like business and tourism as well. As it doesn't require writing any uh, particular type of programming language uh, code. It's just a set of blocks that are interconnected and uh, a, a set of settings uh, for some relevant parameters, in particular context for uh, uh, for specific algorithm, and doesn't require write, uh, knowing uh, loops uh, and some other uh, like branch, branching loops uh, and uh, programming uh, uh, concepts. So now we'll see what is actually the set of blocks that is offered by Rapid Miner. Uh, these blocks, as I said, graphical blocks, are called uh, operators. So when it comes to data preparation, what we'll see is retrieve uh, block that gives the possibility to actually load uh, the data repository, uh, which is already uh, imported into Rapid Miner. Here we just need to specify uh, what is the source of data that we want to analyze. Uh, moreover, we have set role element that we'll see as well and it actually sets uh, uh, the role of a tree attribute, like whether it's the target, the prediction, uh, or, or some other type of value like ID. And uh, here for data preparation, we can convert, uh, for example, numerical to binomial variables, setting some threshold, like if it's greater than five, it is one, it's, if it's less than five, it would, it would be zero. Uh, when it comes to uh, algorithms and techniques of data mining that are supported within rapid minor operators, here are the, the most uh, commonly used ones. So when it comes to classification, we have name bias, decision tree, ID tree. Uh, when it comes to regression, we have linear, polynomial regression and many others, sub-variants and derivation of uh, these methods. Uh, Moreover, there are also algorithms and techniques which cover both classification and regression, uh, like widely popular k-nearest neighbors, um, random forest, and super vector machines. When it comes to uh, neural networks, we also have a support for this approach, which is a bit different than traditional statistical data mining, and, um, but also gives uh, very good results in uh, some cases. Actually, uh, when it comes to neural networks, uh, this approach in artificial intelligence uh, covers also deep learning, the so-called multi-layer neural networks that, apart from input and output layer, have many hidden layers that enable more accurate predictions and are widely adopted in uh, areas like uh, image uh, classification and uh, sound classification, uh, text uh, conversion uh, from one, translation from one language to another, and many others. Um, here I will show uh, the adoption of deep learning techniques as well, apart from the traditional data mining, and they can also be used for classifications and predictions in a similar way like these traditional methods. Uh, when it comes to clustering, I will show k-means algorithm. And finally, when it comes to association rule mining, uh, I will show the, uh, how create association rules element can be used. It's uh, actually the implementation of a priori algorithm, which is uh, the most common technique in uh, market basket analysis. When it comes to these elements, uh, they have up to three inputs. Uh, uh, TRA is the training set, mode is the trained model, which is output. Uh, they have uh, one possible input, uh, excuse me, and uh, up to three outputs. Like the input is uh, the training set. The outputs are the trained model, something that we create as outcome of a training process. Uh, here, some parameters and weights are adjusted in one or many iterations uh, uh, going through the data set. And uh, once we construct the model, which uh, consists of a set of parameters, the so-called weights, uh, hyper uh, some uh, constructed parameters as output of data mining or machine learning process, we can uh, uh, actually apply that model uh, together with the algorithm on our uh, new uh, test data set, which is used to evaluate the trained method. Um, here is uh, uh, EXA is the um, input data set that we actually use to train the model, and way is uh, are actually the trained weights which are uh, constructed as output of this process. Uh, when it comes to uh, performance metrics, 
uh, we can also use performance element from Rapid Miner, and it gives the ability to use these uh, techniques automatically for different types of problems, but we need to specify for which method, like performance for classification, performance for regression, as it will give us uh, different options. For classification, we'll have uh, confusion matrix uh, precision, we call F-score. For regression, we would have um, absolute relative error mean squared error. And uh, when it comes uh, to apply model element, this one actually takes uh, the model as input, the ones that we created as output of this process, and connect it to apply model element uh, together with uh, unlabeled data, the one that we use for test, and the output is uh, actually both the model and the label data, the outcome of prediction. So now let's see the basic rap rapid minor workflow. In the first step, we have to import the data file. We can use for that purpose either Excel, CSV, uh, or some other format, but I will now show how it is done. So, for example, uh, you can see now the, the main screen of uh, rapid minor studio. Uh, the main uh, highest level uh, concept uh, when it comes to data mining processes and uh, the adoption of these techniques is actually the process. So uh, the process is a set of interconnected operator elements. I, I showed which are the most uh, necessary elements in uh, that I will show. But uh, let's start uh, with the first step in the workflow. It's importing the data files. So before doing any data analysis in Rapid Miner, we need to provide the data sources. Here is the Dubton import data. I will browse the data from my computer and find some Excel. Uh, I will find some Excel um, element here uh, that will actually um, rapid minor. Uh, just a moment to see. Okay, it's probably in the documents. Rapid minor. Uh, this one. Okay. For example, I want to take for. Uh, booking cancellation data set. Here it will give me uh, the layout of the data which is imported. And after that, I can uh, go to next step. Here uh, I can also uh, do some adjustments of the data like uh, format, but I will keep it like this. And I have to select where to store my imported uh, file, uh, CSV file. Um, I can put it in my, for example, in this folder, Tourism. I will say, uh, as I already have uh, this data repository, I will say uh, Cancel Train 2 and say Finish. After that, I have the data imported into my Rapid Miner uh, Studio. So here is the data set. You can find it from the design view. The design view is of uh, crucial importance as we have on the left-hand side the data browser where we can find uh, both the data sources uh, that we import, imported, the so-called uh, data repositories, and both and also the processes that we created in the past uh, with this uh, gear uh, symbol. Um, so this is the first step, to import some data file. Moreover, once we import the data within the local repository, uh, we need to actually um, load the data set using the retrieve element. So for example, here in the operator list, you can find retrieve element. It looks like this. So here is the element, uh, the parameter repository entry. I have to select uh, the one uh, data repository that I already uh, imported into my Rapid Miner Studio environment. So I did it in local repository and for example, okay, um, I will do it for example for this churn train. Say okay, and I loaded my data. So after that, I need, once I import all the data that is necessary for predictions, I have to actually set the rows of the elements, uh, which column has uh, which particular role. So before we uh, proceed with the workflow, I will uh, start with one small example 
um, I will introduce you to one case study that I will present and later we'll go back to implement this case study. So the first problem that I'm going to discuss is churn detection for airline services subscribers. So the goal of this case study is to detect the customers that are likely to cancel um, some uh, airline services like uh, club membership, uh, which is uh, renewed annually. Due to COVID-19 in many airline companies, the uh, traffic was reduced by more than 100% in some cases. So it's very uh, important for them now to recover and to identify what they can, uh, to identify the customers that are likely to cancel subscriptions and services or flights and um, to find a, a suitable strategy that would make them uh, actually continue using these services. So for this uh, case study, I will show the adoption of two uh, different techniques. First, I will adopt KNN algorithm for uh, classification, and later I will also use neural networks and compare the results. When it comes to input variables, the factors that are considered as input for this uh, data mining process are the subscription duration, like the number of months, how many, so, uh, how many uh, it lasts, like since the beginning of the year, if it's like uh, one month, five months, six months, um, like number of flights since the beginning of the year. Uh, and uh, actually, um, COVID-19 cases uh, for that period, like uh, what is actually the number of cases in country or uh, some other area some region like continent as well and the output outcome is uh, whether the customer is going to churn or no so now let's see actually uh, what we'll do in the first implementation i will adopt a knn algorithm and i will use the same train and test set but in practice they should be split into distinct cat categories in order to make sure that our model uh, isn't only performing a uh, uh, well on the learned data, but also on new data as well. Um, so now let's start. Uh, let's go back to the uh, rapid miner execution flow, and I will go through the next uh, steps. So the second step is to set label, to set roles actually, set role. Now I have to say, uh, I have first to interconnect these elements. This is the data flow. The process uh, re represents actually the data flow. So the output is actually the loaded data and the, it goes to the input of set row element, to the example input. It's example, um, it means uh, the data set. So here I have to select the corresponding attribute. Okay, churn, it is a target attribute and I will say label. So. I want to say to uh, RapidMiner that uh, churn parameter should be treated as label, classification label. In this case, we are uh, going to use a binary classification, which will give uh, two possible values, true or false, whether the customer is going to leave the services or not. So the, uh, the next step is to train the model. So uh, before that, I need to find the appropriate modeling element. And then for classification and interconnect the output, which is actually um, the the data set with the role of churn set to label. And after that, I need to set parameters for the model. So uh, how actually uh, works uh, KNN algorithm? It actually classifies uh, some observations, some new observation, taking into account uh, class correspondence, uh, class labels of uh, nearby uh, observation examples. So if this red one is new and has to be classified, we consider uh, K nearest neighbors. It means uh, uh, actually uh, how are they neighbors according to some metric. Like here we can select like uh, mixed Euclidean distance is used as metric to distinguish whether some elements are uh, close to each other or no. Um, moreover, here we can set a K, which actually corresponds to the number of neighbors that are being considered uh, when it comes to classification. So uh, we select the class of this red uh, ball uh, uh, based on the majority of its neighbors. So if majority of these neighbors are actually uh, blue or, for example, represent uh, class uh, churn, we'll also say that red is also uh, going to become blue, actually, 
that is going to churn. But uh, as we have only two yellow that are not churn, non churners, it means that three against two actually would uh, give the outcome that a uh, new observation would take the label of the class that has majority in the neighborhood. Um, I, I put uh, k number five as I want to take into account five neighbors. Um, after that, uh, let's go to the flow. Moreover, what we need to do, we need to actually apply the model. So, um, I need to find apply model element. Light bulb uh, is icon here, as you can see, and I connect the model together with the uh, ex example data. Uh, I, I will use the same data set. I can also load another uh, data uh, using retrieval element that is not overlapping with this one and bring it here. But in this ex short, uh, quick examples, I will uh, do it with the same data set. So uh, once I have both the model and then unlabeled data set, the one that is used for testing, uh, fed into Apply, apply model um, element, I can actually either do the performance metrics or uh, directly um, output the results of predictions. Uh, so this lab means labeled data, the output of classification process, and I connect it here, uh, as you can see, uh, to the result output. Uh, this is the console where I will uh, show the, what is the result of the process. And once I have all the elements connected, I can say like this. So as you can see, churn is actually what is what was the expected value and prediction is what I got as output of this process. So as you can see, it matches in most cases expect, except um, this one. So it performs quite well. But how can we do the automatic performance metrics if we use... Uh, so we can also evaluate model, not only to see the results, but the uh, automatic uh, evaluation as well. So also uh, what is very nice in uh, this uh, software environment is that it offers uh, uh, some types of elements, the performance elements that do this for us automatically. Uh, so I will take this one as we have binary classification, connect uh, the output to the input of performance as it takes label data. And finally, the performance output is connected to the results. So once I launch uh, execution, so it has that, um, as you can see, the uh, you can see accuracy is 87.5%. As we have this one sample that was not uh, classified correctly. So this one was the simplest example of a KNN algorithm for classification. But OK, we did that uh, using one approach. But we want to see uh, how deep learning approach uh, performs uh, in such situation. So in some cases, it's uh, even better, gives better results as Deep learning um, gives the ability to uh, incorporate, integrate um, uh, implicitly some uh, non-linearities within the model and handle them better than uh, traditional data mining techniques. So now I will put deep learning technique uh, block operator instead, delete my KNN and reconnect the block to the flow. So now I will put example output to the training input and here I will connect uh, model and example data to the apply model element, which are actually here the parameters that can be set. Okay, very relevant uh, for uh, deep learning techniques is the number of hidden layers and their sizes. So in some cases, the uh, larger uh, layer size, the lar greater number of uh, perceptron units, the so-called uh, artificial neurons uh, leads to better results and even a greater number of layers as well. But it can also cause on the other side um, overfitting of the data, so it needs to be balanced uh, and it can be uh, actually uh, evaluated uh, using many experiments and seeing what actually happens as we increase or decrease the number of layers or uh, their sizes. So here I will leave it as it was, like 50 layers, two hidden layers with 50. 
uh, units each and execute and uh, as you can see it actually uh, performs similarly in this case um, so in some cases it can give better results in some cases not but uh, both approaches actually exist and can be adopted so if i maybe reduce the number of uh, units per layer so now as you can see I adjusted a bit the layers. I avoided the overfitting as I, okay, I must mention that I have a quite small data set as these are like uh, educational examples and I want to avoid performance lags uh, working with very huge data sets, but it overfit uh, when I have too many uh, nodes per layer, it actually overfitted the data. So it, uh, it cannot give very good uh, predictions, but when I reduce the number of uh, perceptions per layer to 40, I achieved a 100% uh, accuracy. So all the uh, all the elements observations were correctly classified. Okay, this was the first example. Now let's go to another one uh, and go through the same flow and see how, for example, uh, reservation cancellation uh, can be implemented, which is highly relevant for people in tourism industry as well. It's quite similar, the, the implementation, but the data set is a bit different. So uh, the first is percentage of travels uh, against the total number of travels and season uh, like uh, winter, spring, summer, as uh, for some particular season in given area, a larger number of turns are likely to arrive. When it comes to the third input variable, it's number of COVID-19 cases, which actually, uh, okay, logically thinking, we can uh, conclude that larger number of COVID-19 cases in most situations actually reduces, uh, uh, the, uh, actually increases the uh, possibility that someone will cancel the uh, reservation. So if we have a very small number of COVID-19 cases, it is likely that the customer is not going to cancel his or her booking. So let's look at this uh, example. I will use the same, mo same model. I will change the data set by, uh, so we can do it with the same flow as it is completely uh, the same. Uh, I will just switch the data set. I will uh, say cancel train. But one thing that we need to do before proceeding is this one. So the attribute, the target label is not called churn as previously, but it's called cancel. So I need to switch the role to, of label to new attribute that is called cancel. And now it won't give me uh, the warning. So after that, if I execute it, it gives me 90.91% uh, accuracy. Let's look at the data set uh, because I, I quickly uh, proceed to the output, but you can see it here. Like this is the input uh, set, the season like, uh, winter, autumn, summer, spring, a ratio of how many uh, uh, completed travels the customer has and the number of COVID-19 cases. As you could see, um, okay, if I only connect the results, like, okay, here the results can be also connected to the output. You can see that actually, so here is the, uh, tab with performance, it's 100%, here is the output table. So it was correct in all the cases, for example, when large number of COVID-19 cases is present, for that area, we will also have that cancellation is more likely to occur. Otherwise, if we have like small number of COVID-19 cases, it is likely that a uh, customer will actually go uh, to travel on that desired destination. And, um, Okay, uh, for example, there could be uh, many more patterns that can be identified if we have very huge data set. Um, okay, we, I can do it also with KNN in a similar way as I did before. Okay, I will reconnect the elements. Um, model goes from here to here, example goes from here to here. I executed and you could see when it comes to performance, it's a bit lower. So yes, in this case, neural network showed be better re results. 
Okay, and this was the second case study. Now let's see how uh, can we adopt a regression in tourism industry and somehow predict the number of guests that are going to arrive to desired tourist destination, taking into account season and COVID-19 cases. So similar factors as here, but uh, without this uh, percentage ratio. So it is very important to predict the number of tourists in order to make strategy, how to actually handle the possible consequences of larger or small number of tourists, like uh, the, the small no the decrease of tourists in um, and actually the reduction of tourism uh, uh, as well, uh, in general during the COVID-19 pandemic has caused many uh, awful uh, consequences like huge number of uh, people uh, who lost their jobs also losses for uh, hospitality industry also many other uh, to say side effects like uh, local craftsmanship selling souvenirs and some uh, local traditional uh, food or products also was uh, uh, dramatically re reduced and apart from huge number of lost lives uh, also we have a stagnation of economy in many countries especially in countries which are uh, under development uh, and uh, and on the other side in the countries that rely on tourism heavily rely on tourism and uh, most of the, the of the uh, contributions actually come from uh, to uh, this industry so now let's see uh, how to adopt uh, regression i will create new process a blank process and start from the beginning i will do it with retrieve element now i will take another data set um, from my local repository tourism and it's called regression train. Okay, now I need to set the rows. I will put the row. Okay, now I wh what is the target output that I want to produce? The red one is number of guests that I want to predict here. And I will say like this, it's going to be a label. As well it's called label but actually it's a numerical value it's not categorical output okay i will apply line here okay i will type regression to find the operator okay linear regression i will con interconnect the elements find the apply model and see the output okay I already discussed how the connections between the elements are made. Now I let, let me set the parameters, if there are any which can uh, dramatically change something. Okay, uh, uh, this, um, there are many options for feature selection and they can um, actually lead to different results, but more experimentation is needed in order to conclude uh, what is the right direction. Uh, here I will show with default parameters what, uh, which is the produced output. So here, as you can see, these are the predictions. The prediction column, uh, the prediction of guests says what is the output of linear regression and guest is the expected, the original value that we have, the true value. You can see it's not quite accurate in all the cases. Here it's fine, but uh, uh, you can see here is also acceptable, but in this case, it's not performing well. Okay. so. Definitely, the relationship between these variables is not necessarily um, is not necessarily uh, linear. So uh, this is actually the, the the reason why a deep learning approach would probably give us better results. Considering the data set, like for some season, it means that more people will, would arrive. Uh, regardless of um, number of COVID-19 cases. Like some places are very popular during summer or winter, like ski centers. So people are likely to arrive, even if number of uh, COVID-19 cases is not so small. Um, in such situations, actually, uh, okay, but uh, also for some destination, it can uh, vary as well. So I will now um, uh, do the performance evaluation to see, uh, okay, it won't give very good results. As you can see, uh, I will put performance element for regression. 
Okay, I will connect it. Label performance goes to the output just a second. Okay, performance. Now when I execute it, okay, now I can set here the desired uh, criteria, the desired performance metrics. I will say I want relative error, absolute error, root mean squared error. And execute it once again, and I can see uh, the values of um, these metrics. Okay, um, now let me try it with a deep learning block. Now I reconnect it to the rest of the flow and say here, okay, uh, I can set the number of nodes per layer. Um, it can remain like this. If I execute it, you can see that relative error in this case uh, should be like, um, okay, it's this value. I can run it once more to see what happens as, uh, in deep learning, uh, there are initial parameter value, initial weight values for the neural network that are adjusted in many iterations. So sometimes it can uh, use different distribution random value for initialization. So this is the reason why in many runs I can achieve different results as it converts uh, faster uh, when uh, some particular var values are randomly generated. But in some other cases, uh, the, the convergence can be slower. So now I should like uh, error of a relative error of 90%. But as I already told, if I put linear, um, linear regression, it's quite uh, worse. So, okay, I need to reconnect this one. Okay, this goes to the mall, this goes to the I'll label. I'm sorry, just to execute it now. Okay, you can see that relative error is now quite large. Okay, this is this was the third case study that I wanted to show. Now let's switch to another algorithm, another method. This is called uh, a market basket analysis, as I already mentioned. So what is the goal of this particular uh, tourism industry related case study that I will present now. So as uh, you already uh, probably thought about it when I first mentioned, in tourism industry, uh, we also have some kind of products. Maybe they are not physical products in all the cases, but they could, could be like additional services or additional excursions, travels, um, cruises, or maybe some uh, visits, some paid uh, museum visits or exhibition visits. So now uh, our goal is to identify uh, which are actually the services that customers buy together going to the same destination. Like um, if we go, for example, uh, to my uh, region uh, where I was born, Pirot, people are likely to visit Museum of Ponishavlje and to buy some local uh, craftsmanship uh, food products like traditional pirot cheese and um, iron sausage, uh, these two specialties. So it is quite an um, obvious example in my region, but uh, I just give it to illustrate uh, what is the point here. So we can also uh, identify like if people come to pirot, they are likely to visit uh, uh, ski centers that are nearby, like uh, it's called Babinzub, and uh, many other observations could be made in this context, like to identify what could be the right uh, travel bundle uh, for customers that could attract them more to come to visit some particular destination. So uh, here, what is the input? The inputs are invoices of users, which products and services they bought as part of uh, travel. Um, now I will show you the flow. It's a bit larger. I won't be creating it uh, from scratch this time. So I will browse my local repository and find it here, association rules. Okay, now I first load the transactions from uh, basket tourism data set. As you can see, 
uh, we have uh, transaction data like uh, the number of orders, the type of product, and the value, well, actually the price that the customer paid for the service and the invoice it belongs to. So, apart from typical uh, preparation uh, blocks that I explained here, we also have aggregation that actually aggregates the products, uh, concatenates the products that belong to the same um, product, uh, to the same invoice. So we take uh, product, sales value, and order number and conca concatenate them to the same invoice. As we can see here, that, for example, this invoice has many products, these two products. This invoice has three products. So first we prepare the data by uh, making uh, the one only one entry for each invoice with all the uh, products concatenated. So the concatenation of the products is renamed using edit parameter, uh, rename, uh, re actually rename operator um, to rename this, okay, uh, the old name, the previous name was concat uh, product one uh, column, but the new name that uh, is actually uh, going to be used uh, when we reference it further in the flow is products. Okay, now we set the role, we select the invoice parameter and say that it is going to be the ID. Okay, when it comes to a priori technique, we have uh, two relevant parameters, minimum support and confidence, minimum confidence. These two actually uh, tune uh, how the association rules uh, are going to be discovered, how strong they need to be in order to be identified within the uh, result set. So as I, if I leave it like this uh, on the default values, 0 0.005 for minimum support and 0 0.1 for minimum confidence and execute it, the output would give me the discovered rules. So as you can see, uh, it is discovered that if customer is likely to uh, buy a product 11, he or she is also likely to uh, activate these two products or services 12 and 20. So when it comes to the uh, results you can see that we have both uh, the rules of size 3 and 2. So we can adjust this parameter manually here. Um, it should be um, here In the results, okay, max size. So if we, uh, but actually, what is the problem here? Here we don't have uh, the uh, men, more than three transactions per bill. So only, only three, uh, up to three items together can be identified. Okay, if we say only three, uh, it is minimum size of the uh, bill, like minimum number of items. This is this is maximum size. Actually, the maximum possible number. If we say two, from two to three, it will give us all the rules that have two items and three items. If we have uh, three and three, it will only give us uh, the rules that contain three items both together. And so uh, the, the support size has to be, as we saw, at least uh, zero, zero, 005. So the strongest rules, so greater the minimum support, the stronger the rules. So if we have this um, uh, three that are 0 0.006, it means that we, they will be included into result set. If we have some rules with lower value of uh, minimum support, if we say like this, in the results, we can also have some weaker rules you can see we have many more rules, but they have 0 0.004. So we can experiment, but it actually um, is not very important now in this context. But when it comes to realistic case studies, uh, more realistic with larger data sets, it, can, it is quite useful to see how it behaves for different parameter values. Okay, and the final case study that I will show today is the application of a clustering uh, for tourist segmentation. So the goal of this case study is to identify different types of uh, tourists that will arrive to some particular destination. Uh, this way, the uh, companies and hotels uh, and tourist agencies can also arrange some, uh, to say, um, 
different bundles or uh, uh, offer different products uh, regarding the type of reservation that is being made, which are actually uh, the three input factors that are considered. The number of travelers, travelers like uh, one, two, three, or many, we'll see. The duration of stay, like how many days the persons that made the reservation actually want to stay. And spending, what is the bill for the reservation? The output is cluster number zero or one. Uh, okay, I wanted to split the data into two clusters. And when we uh, do the interpretation of the cluster, so when it comes to clustering, it is not uh, always just enough to perform the algorithm and execute it, but uh, to somehow uh, manually uh, take a look at the results and make some conclusions. So as outcome of this analysis, uh, I, I concluded that two types of customers were identified. The business clusters that actually have number of persons, which is usually up to two, the st stay duration, which is shorter, like uh, just a few days, and higher costs. When it comes to other types of customers, we have uh, mostly family, family and couple arrangements uh, with larger number of people to up to many, to six, or 10, uh, duration is always longer and total spending is always quite lower. But now let's start with the creation of a uh, clustering flow, which adopts K-means uh, algorithm, which is very uh, famous in uh, aerial data mining. Okay, let me start new flow. Okay, now let's retrieve element. I will load the data from the local repository. It's called clustering tourism. And now what else I need to do to apply the clustering element using k-means algorithm. Okay, I connect the output of the retrieve element to the example input of clustering and the cluster output to the result terminal. Here I can set several parameters like k is actually uh, k-means algorithm, actually the k-means how much, how many clusters I want to have as output of this analysis. I say two, maximum number of runs, how many types it goes through the data, and here are some different types of measures used in order to identify the likelihood of, um, of observations. Um, I will do it with uh, the default ones, Okay, so uh, the first output here is actually the number of items per cluster, but the second output gives me actually the labeled uh, data, the labeled samples from the data set. So if I do it like this, I will get the cluster numbers for each of the observations. You can see if I uh, sort it by clicking here uh, with respect to cluster value, uh, we can see that uh, for example, this cluster zero uh, example has one traveler duration of two days and price of 65, so uh, 650. So it is definitely a business traveler as we have larger price and smaller number of travelers, short duration. It is also similar for this one. We have two travel travelers duration, which is two days, but uh, price, which is uh, a bit high. But for on the other side, if we take a look at cluster one, uh, members, we can see that uh, number of travelers can be quite large, like five, the duration is larger as well, eight days, but the price is lower, it's five covered. This is actually the implementation of a clustering case study, uh, where we segment customers, and it is quite useful uh, for information systems, which makes offers uh, additional, of additional services uh, to customers, uh, like uh, it is less likely that uh, someone who is making a, a family tr or a couple travel is going to uh, go for a rent a car. But on the other side, for example, business travelers are uh, which come uh, using, for example, by plane uh, without using their own car, they are more likely that will uh, actually take a rent a car uh, to finish uh, their uh, their tasks quickly in these uh, one or two days. Okay, um, now we can uh, sum up and go to the conclusion. So, um, 
According to the results and these examples that we have seen, the case studies uh, that I uh, came up to uh, in previous period, uh, and also regarding the existing works, but there are not so many existing works uh, regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and we are quite pioneering in this area, the adoption of data mining um, uh, and um, in area of post-COVID-19 tourism and its recovery, uh, together with uh, my colleague Vasya Rodlek and Professor Nino. So actually, um, it has very huge potential uh, in uh, in this, uh, tourism industry in general. But on the other side, as I already mentioned, uh, it's, it's crucial uh, as well for post-COVID-19 recovery of tourism sector. We have seen that these case studies somehow give us ability to predict and proactively react to the future uh, events. This way, we could avoid a huge number of uh, lost, uh, lost uh, tourists, huge number of lost uh, jobs in tourism industry, and somehow uh, reduce the overall loss that was caused by this uh, pandemic. Uh, on the other side, we have seen how rapid miner tool can be used uh, for these tasks. It's quite intuitive. It has a nice graphical interface uh, with uh, block elements that are interconnected, doesn't require some advanced database or programming knowledge, just basic concepts of data mining and basic concepts of uh, da uh, data, uh, like uh, data representation in order to be adopted. And this way, it's quite suitable for people in business area management and tourism as well, as they don't need to spend too much time learning uh, programming concepts. Like uh, on the other side, we have Python, uh, which is quite popular nowadays. But if we dive deeper into Python, it can be seen that it's quite complex uh, uh, and it requires uh, uh, much more time to be uh, confident uh, and um, convenient with. So. Uh, for some initial pro prototypes, for some uh, research preliminary analysis, a uh, rapid miner is quite a good tool. Um, but when it comes to production ready solutions that are integrated within the uh, business information systems, uh, Python is uh, now maybe a bit more used, but um, in, in some other areas, but in management and tourism, uh, rapid miner is still uh, dominant. Maybe in future, if uh, some other libraries emerge in Python, it will also be more interesting uh, to explore for people without computer science background. But for now, uh, I think that uh, it's rapid miner offers a lot and uh, gives the ability to actually implement some uh, ideas quickly uh, to brainstorm some, some ideas and evaluate them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your very useful and interesting presentation. Uh, I think we need uh, more to see, to practice uh, and uh, use them in our uh, practical work, in our research. Uh, so, the questions, uh, dear listeners, dear participants of the seminar, you can put to the questions. Yeah. Uh, I have a question, if I may. Okay. Uh, in your examples, uh, we saw that you took some data and then you used different uh, ways of regression or other analysis yeah. to get some result. Uh, does the rapid miner mine data from websites or do you have to provide the data as a file? Okay, uh, like actually in this case, um, uh, as, uh, as I've been using rapid miner for some time, I did not use these capabilities. As far as I know, I'm, I'm quite sure that maybe it can be integrated uh, in some way but the basic features the most basic features does uh, do not offer this so we need to actually take some uh, it, it maybe it is possible but it's quite more complex so the better approach is definitely to uh, download the data and uh, have it in csv and import it but probably uh, 
with combination of many elements or some additional plugins, uh, it could be possible. Thank you. More questions, please. Uh, so maybe you mentioned, uh, but uh, I would like to ask uh, once more. Uh, in this uh, platform is uh, uh, very simple uh, to access, but is it free? Yeah. Uh, download and install and uh, then. Uh, yeah, when it comes to uh, when it comes to student licenses and educational, um, it's a full version which has some performance limitation, as I mentioned. Like uh, it gives the set of all features, but only uh, the speed of uh, achieved using parallelism and uh, processing huge amounts of data is restricted. So we have limitation to to, to ten thousand rows and one logical processor. In commercial application, we can uh, uh, work with larger data sets and use many processors that can speed up the process. So uh, if we register with educational uh, email, it will definitely give us the ability to uh, download the Rapid Miner, which is uh, a full version. But it's not applicable for commercial purposes. So mm -hmm. additional licenses are needed in order to use it uh, uh, widely. So here are some options, but um, um, at some step it will probably ask for uh, email uh, that is related to educational institution. Uh -huh, thank you. And uh, just a second, uh, my second question is uh, about, um, um, yeah, it's, it's very useful to analyze the micro da data and um, for managerial decisions, as I understand, if I understand well. And uh, if you have a practice and uh, could you um, explain how can uh, we use it uh, on the, um, uh, on the macro level, for example, for uh, political decisions, for example, for uh, regional, uh, regarding the regional development, uh, for example, uh, uh, do this uh, software system uh, um, has a large large opportunity to uh, include different uh, sectors for example agricultural uh, um, for example uh, hospitality sector uh, manufacturing or so on if we yeah. take, for example territorial uh, development um, issue uh, okay, so in general, this Rapid Miner Studio actually offers a wide set of machine learning and data mining features. So, as long as uh, we have data, they can be applied. So, uh, mm -hmm. we can experiment in any area of industry, regardless of the particular case study. So, mm -hmm. it is, of course, applicable in almost any discipline. Like I said, in um, telco industry, it's widely adopted for churn detection, detecting the customers that are likely to leave. Uh, also, for example, in education, it has many other applications like predicting the outcome of uh, stu student grade and so on. When it comes to larger, uh, to larger considerations and region development, there are many possible case studies as well. But one problem that uh, we can face in a case of regional development, political decision to say, or strategical management regarding the resources and development, um, is the the visibility, the accessibility to data. So, mm -hmm. as long as we have access to huge amount of data, and as long as uh, we can, uh, uh, we are allowed to use it, we can of course achieve many different observations. This is the only problem when it comes to more serious uh, decisions based on, based on data mining techniques using not only the rapid miner, but uh, any tool that is actually uh, processing data. So there should be no any to say a barrier to this expect, except the restrictions related to privacy, security or um, visibility of data. Yeah, I understand. Thank you very much. Yes, so we data basis uh, and uh, observation and uh, receive really good uh, 
micro micro data basis uh, is uh, crucial to receive uh, to receive good results uh, maybe our other participants uh, have questions professor tanta mikaberizen may maybe would like to ask something or tell us something um hello uh, i I, hello? I don't have a question just uh, i would like to thank professor Nara petrovich offered a very interesting and very practical and useful uh, topic thank you I, I would like to highlight that it's very practical and uh, the software platforms which covers the maturism industry it's very interesting for us uh, so um, you uh, discussed about the issue of comprehensively and addressed many issues and cases so uh, it was really interesting um, and uh, it, it, it was not uh, interesting not only uh, our for researchers uh, but uh, i think that it uh, it's very interesting for representatives of tourism national agencies and tourism agencies and um miss nina we should uh, invite them <laughs> this time, so uh, so um, thank you very much um, and um, i think that uh, it uh, it's very useful and it it uh, our researchers will uh, use these tools in their future work maybe it uh, will be a good idea to plan and uh, to plan some kind of uh, workshops uh, in the future uh, to learn and uh, study more detail of this uh, software systems because uh, uh, for managerial um, uh, decision making uh, i see it's uh, very very interesting uh, le let's see we will try to uh, find some ways how to plan uh, next uh, uh, workshops or seminars and uh, so on. Uh, other questions, please? <laughs> so, uh, so if you have uh, not uh, any other questions, uh, once again, I would like to uh, tell you uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Menat. Thank you. Uh, also, I would like to uh, to tell uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ignaza Gagnidze from Tbilisi State University, uh, Professor Vasya Roblek, uh, uh, and uh, I think that uh, these uh, seminars will be a good uh, precondition to uh, to continue our academic. Uh, uh, cooperation and uh, just uh, these uh, seminars will be reflected in our uh, everyday academic practical work so we can uh, finish our work and uh, our today's uh, seminar and uh, hope that uh, we will meet again <laughs> in the yeah. future, not only uh, only online in online uh, regime but uh, also in uh, personal and uh, so we hope good academic cooperation bye thank thanks to uh, thank you my, thank my you professor for inviting me so with my lovely lecture <laughs> so and a special thank to vasya Roblik for his uh, so uh, this kind of cooperation with us and uh, deep cooperation thank you vasya. Thank you, everyone, and nice to meet you. And uh, I, I'm really glad if uh, we have some other opportunity for collaboration in future. And here you can see the links, uh, which I forgot to mention during the presentation, to GitHub repository with the materials and a preprint of paper, which actually contains uh, a text about the, the presentation. Thank you very much once again. Bye. Bye.